celebrating 10 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, U.S. Senator Bob Corker. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill, and these are great stories about great people who prove with their lives that anything is possible. My guest this week is Senator Bob Corker. Welcome to the broadcast. I don't know. He's good to be with you. Chattanooga, Tennessee has a special place in my heart because were it not for Chattanooga, I would not be. My right. father was born and raised there, and as I was kind of tracking through your story, I thought, why don't we start in Chattanooga because it is the place that gave both of us life, so why don't we start there? Uh, talk to me a little bit about growing up in Chattanooga. Well, I loved it. I moved there when I was 10 or 11. My dad was an engineer with DuPont, and so we moved from Aiken, South Carolina, to Chattanooga. We were transferred there and, and uh, immediately, uh, you know, began playing sports there and went to a public high school downtown. It's called, I called it City High School. It's called Chattanooga High School, and, and uh, I loved to work. Um, you know, I began working when I was 13, just picking up trash at a playground, but moved on to bagging ice and eventually uh, working as a construction laborer, but you know, I loved growing up there. I loved the public high school that I went to. I loved playing sports. I loved working. And What sport? I, loved, I played uh, football and baseball. So, really? Yeah. What was your biggest love between the two? Well, you know, baseball, I ended up playing a couple of years here at UT. I was better at it. Uh, I knew after a couple of years I was not going to be a professional player and moved on to focusing on work, but I got to tell you that the playing football my senior year at City High School was probably the best. I loved it. Talk to me about your dad. Um, mm -hmm. You said he was an engineer for DuPont. How mm -hmm. did he shape and affect your life? You know, my dad was one of the most decent uh, people uh, that I've ever met. He's passed away now. Um, he was a real, he had a servant's heart. You know, he was one of those guys that always showed up did the right things. I mean, I showed up, I mean, when there was something of need in the community, he was always there to help by example. And, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, just very organized. I, I know when he used to get his check, he would put the part that needed to go into the bank into the bank, and he'd set these, he had these little envelopes in a metal box, and he'd set aside money for laundry, set aside you know, money to, to go eat in a restaurant once a week after church and all those kind of things. So just a very organized but funny, was, had this uh, intellectual curiosity. It was always, you know, he'd always say, son, it's a sad day when you don't learn something new. But uh, uh, a tremendous example. And I think uh, the greatest example was just his care for other human beings and his willingness uh, to always be there when somebody needed something. Tell me about your mom. My mother was uh, more of the energy spark plug of the family and a great personality. She's, she's uh, 83 today. She plays golf two days a week, believe it or not. I had dinner with her last night in, Ch last night in Chattanooga, but she was very personable. and sh They both had grown up in South Carolina and, and married at a very young age. And, um, but, you know, just very personable, outgoing, uh, and hopefully uh, I was able to, to draw something from both of them. Again, she's one of the finest people that I know on earth, and anybody who comes in contact, or, contact with her feels better uh, having been around her. So you're bracketed by these two incredible people, brothers and sisters? Um, I have a sister who's two years younger and lives in Atlanta, and again, just an all-star of a human being. I mean, she's wonderful. So I'm, I'm wondering how your father, being a very organized and caring person, affected your view of business because every time that I've ever talked to you, I've noticed a couple of things. Number one, you seem to be mm -hmm. focused. You, you're moving. You're moving ahead. Mm -hmm. But you always mention work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's part of your narrative, your storyline from 13, 14 years mm -hmm. of age. And I'm wondering where you get that drive and why work became so important to you so early. Was it from the model set for you by your father, or where does that come from? You know, I grew up in a middle-class family, and I can't share a hardship. I mean, it right. was, like, ideal. You know, we didn't have too much. We didn't have too little. 
Um, I don't know. I just love to work. I, 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 you know, whatever time I had, I wanted to, uh, when I wasn't playing sports or going to school or whatever, I just liked it. And, you know, I do, obviously, yes, I saw my dad get up every morning at 530 and, you know, head down to, to the DuPont plant and, and work. And, and I, yes, I mean, I learned very much about discipline in that way. But I don't know what caused me to like work so much. I have mean, you have you analyzed what it is about work that you like? Oh, I think it's being productive. I think it's producing. It's yeah. doing something. And you know, I ended up fortunately being in a business, the construction business, early on in life. I went in business when I was 25 after spending four years as a superintendent, learning how to build a building, uh, building shopping centers around the country, and then did that myself in business. But, uh, you know, producing something that you could see and, you know, one of the frustrations I have in my current job is, you know, we're not quite as productive right. in Washington as we, as, uh, you know, I was in business. I noticed that that has been one of your frustrations because superintendents, uh, CEOs, and I know a lot of your friends that are CEOs, mm -hmm. they almost live by punch list. Yeah. You get a vision of something and it becomes a punch list of items and you yeah. go. Yeah, um, right. But I never thought about it until you just said it, that the productivity, being able to start with nothing, see a possibility and create something, that's the real jazz, isn't it? It is. You know, I, I have the opportunity because of my job to speak sometimes to college graduates or high school graduates, and I say three things. You know, number one, master something. Master something as yeah. soon as you get out of school because... If you master something, you there have cre you've created independence for life. Secondly, have a bold vision, you know, because if you get 80% of the way towards accomplishing a bold vision, it's so much further than if you accomplish a very small vision. And thirdly, like you, you know, give back, always give back to your community and to the world. But no, you know, I've got a black notebook that my wife just absolutely tests. I take it with me everywhere on vacation and other places. But you're right. I mean, people in business and people with a vision usually have a, a list of things they're going to accomplish every day that moves them towards accomplishing that vision. And I've had this notebook. I've had to, I've gone through several because they get old and fall apart. But in my in my entire business life, and as mayor, I might add, and as commissioner of finance. Um, I was able to go through that list every day and knock things out. Uh, being in the Senate is a whole different ball game, and you know, it takes. Uh, I mean, you're just not able to to rapid fire through those things. You're scheduled every day, and you know what you're going to do. You know, they program you every 15 minutes, it seems. But the accomplishment of being able to actually knock something off that list is is a much different deal. This is Bob Corker, he's my guest. The program is Anything is Possible. More in just a moment. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. But I think that involvement with people in need and, and seeing there were ways that business people could apply their skills to solve a, a problem in a community that was also transformative. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill and my guest is Senator Bob Corker. So you built a, a successful business. I, I'm intrigued as you as have always known, I'm very intrigued about business. How did you grow as a man? Because it's one thing to be an entrepreneur and to do it all yourself. It's quite another to make that transition to being able to lead and trust other people because you can read a resume and someone can interview well but there's another thing where you look at a, a young man or a young woman and you know they've got to have this this and this if they want to play at this level yeah, did think, you develop that ability I, I, I think I was pretty good Howard and I, I mean I look at the staff we have right now with the Senate and I, I just would match them up against anybody I look at the staff I had as mayor would match them up against anybody and I think our company was outstanding. I, I tell you, you know, obviously the first thing is just the integrity of the person and knowing that that when they tell you something, that's the way that it is. You know, you look at the way they've led their life. You look at the way they respond to people. Uh, obviously, a sense of fair play. I mean, the reason, you know, we never did any advertising in our business, and yet we grew at 80% a year. And as you mentioned earlier, I mean, it was word of mouth. 
And that word of mouth comes from treating people, having, having a sense of fair play, treating them the way that you would want yourself to be treated. But then also, you know, you want people that are hungry. You know, they want to succeed. They, they themselves, uh, in our case, I don't know how many companies were started out of folks who, you right. know, worked at, but a lot, okay? I mean, right. a whole lot. And, you know, you want people who are coming in and, you know, you, you love seeing them grow and you want to see them have the ability themselves, especially in that business. I mean, it's an entrepreneurial business where lots of people want to give it a try. You want to be able to do it and be successful. And by the way, so many of them have been. So in that feels good. It does. But, you know, integrity, a sense of fairness, uh, obviously, they got to have the proficient skills to right. be successful, and they've got to be develop. If they don't have them, develop them, and you need to create an environment where that can happen. But also, you know, you want people who really, you know, are hungry and want to be successful and want to be better than where they are at that point. Now, a, a driven man like yourself, you'll end up building a business, and then it gets to this level, and then you're looking for another challenge, so you build something else that's bigger, and it's kind of. I didn't know this early on. I used to think it was purely about the money, but the more I talk to people who have succeeded at very high levels, it's about the challenge. It's about engineering a new success. That's that's very fulfilling in and of itself. But you had kind of a transformative experience when you went on a trip to Haiti. Mm -hmm. That kind of, and I'm I'm hearkening back to what you said about your father, disciplined, organized, hardworking, but then he had this sense of mm -hmm. of real care for people and community, and you developed that because you stepped away from a very successful business career to become mayor of a community and to vest yourself in building community. Why? When I was about 30, um, I was still single, and, and the business had grown beyond from 25 to 30 what I ever thought it would be, and, and uh, I was reading a church bulletin from my church, and they needed folks to go to Haiti and help build a project down there, and they needed somebody within the church that knew something about construction, and so I called and volunteered, and it was a transformative experience. I just think being around people in need that that were the way they were, I've just never been around such positive, upbeat people who had just almost nothing from the standpoint of, of resources, and it was touching. And so I couldn't be traveling around doing mission trips. I had a company, as I mentioned, that was growing at 80 percent a year. And so I got involved in our inner city down on Reed and Mitchell Streets, and there I began to see that we had thousands of Chattanoogans that didn't have decent housing. So um, through a series of meeting different people, the last one being Jim Rouse in Columbia, Maryland, um, who had a huge impact on my life. He's one of the people that helped me think about having a bold, really bold vision. But I led the creation of a nonprofit uh, when I was like, I don't know, 32 or 3 or 4 years old that has helped over 10,000 families in Chattanooga have decent housing. And Halloran, having to go out and talk to people about, you know, contributing money. To, this, by the way, was a civic endeavor. I never right. did it for pay. I was a founding board member, but you know, had my company still growing. But I think that involvement with people in need and, and seeing there were ways that business people could apply their skills to solve a, a problem in a community, that was also transformative. And uh, I went on, as you know, to, to enter the public arena and, and, uh, and, you know, How old were you when you ran for mayor? I actually had been commissioner of finance first. I was appointed to that position back in the middle 90s, and I was about 42 years old. And again, I served for about a year and a half, 17 months, went back in business, and, uh, and ended up buying two companies back in Chattanooga. One was founded in 1886, another in about the 1930s, and merged them together with a development company that I had kept and was doing work at that time. So I was 48-ish uh, by the time I acquired, I think I was mayor at 48, and I did it, Halloran, not as a political job. I mean, it was, to me, a civic job. Right, you, know, you wanted a job, to get back. You know, it was a job where, you know, business guy steps out of business for four years to be mayor of a city, and I never thought of anything in a political context. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. Let's take a break. When we come okay. back, I want to talk about you moving to Senate. And I want to know what Mr. Rouse said to you yeah. that reshaped your thinking. Okay. This is Anything is Possible. My guest is Bob Corker. 
Coming up. You know, this is a different job. I mean, this is a, a, a battle of, of uh, you know, philosophy and ideals and the direction of a nation, and nothing happens quickly. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. My guest this week is Senator Bob Corker. Do you have a nickname? No, I mean, I think in high school I had a coach that called me Corkball or something, but <laughs> nobody calls me. You know, I don't know what people call me now. Yeah, you know. I don't know if I want to know. Right. <laughs> what did Mr. Rouse say to you? You said this guy, you went up to Columbia, Maryland, and he told yeah. you to, to have a bold vision. And you said, you know, you're a guy, somebody gets your attention when they say something significant. Jim Rouse was a guy who had built big malls all around the country, and as you can imagine, having been in the shopping center business myself, him even far more successful, I knew who he was. And he, at a point in life, committed himself to helping people have decent housing around the country, okay, and led something called the Enterprise Foundation. Um, I think most people view me as a, a conservative Republican. Uh, he was, a, you know, very much a, a not that, you know, liberal right. Democrat. Um, and he'd been involved with efforts in and out of Washington for some time. But we, he really uh, helped me. Uh, I was going to help people in Chattanooga with housing, and I was going to figure out a way to do it. But he made me think about it, caused me to think about it in a much bigger way. And again, having that huge vision. And the vision became, and this was how this entity was started, to provide the opportunity for all Chattanoogans to have decent, fit, and affordable housing. Again, yeah, it's the important word, to use the word opportunity. All. Opportunity, and not all. guarantee, and all. and all. Yeah, now he would have been more on the provide side, right. and that's where he and, and I would have. I'm more on the side as you provide the opportunity. That's right. right. But, but the uh, word all is a very all. big word. So that everybody that, that wants to seek that opportunity or has the, you know, Everybody has a chance to try to, to have a, a decent home, and and I think we accomplished that in large but part. But why did you do that? What, what I don't know. shifted I, in I, you? I think, you know, uh, working down on the weekends uh, around people in such need, I think one real transformative experience was we had two young boys that had come around to help us. Well, I mean, we used to just pick up tires out of people's yards or, you know, especially right. senior citizens, and it was mostly, it was all inner city. Um, but I remember uh, taking these guys back to their house. They were in high school. They went to the same high school I'd graduated from. And I walked in their home, just standing there at the front door. Their home was, I, I promise you, there are not many people here in Knoxville or East Tennessee that would allow their pet to live in the conditions that, that uh, these two young guys were. Their mom was a... Uh, well, her mom was involved in things that she shouldn't have been involved in. And I just think that touched me. And I thought, you know, here are these young, I know it touched me, these young people, here they're going to the same high school I went to. I look at the life I was able to lead with so many people helping support coaches and others. And here these guys are leading a totally different uh, life. One of the things that I can do is help ensure that young people like this can grow up at least in a home that is decent and fit for a human being. And I don't know, you know, the rest is, you know, it took off and obviously, um, and people got involved and, and, and if you want to know the truth, the fact that I had been successful in business, I mean, it's a pretty loony idea to go out and say, we want to provide the opportunity right, right, for right, all right. Chattanoogas to have decent fit and affordable housing. But the fact that I had been successful in business, people said, well, let's go. And, and we ended up with a great board and great support from the city and county, and, and, and it had a long, long run. I mean, it had helped a lot of people. So, okay, so then now that, that helps to make sense for me of purpose when it comes to being a mayor and then even moving on to the U.S. Senate because you got the first taste of how you could use success as a way to leverage influence to do something really powerful and good in community. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you step in to be mayor and you realize the force of influence can be good or bad and I can do something transformative. What happened though when you got to the U.S. Senate? Yeah, I do wanna make sure your listening audience knows this and I, I tell people all the time that I think the very best place to make a difference is at the local level and I cherished being mayor of Chattanooga more than anything else I've done. I, I uh, There would be 
four or five times a week, I would go to the podium to talk about something and become emotionally overwhelmed. Just watching a third grade inner city student learn how to to paint art or, I mean, wow. it's just amazing. And, and so, you know, this is a different job. I mean, this is a, a, a battle of, of uh, you know, philosophy and ideals and the direction of a nation and nothing happens quickly. I mean, we're dealing with foreign conflicts. So this is a little different. And I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, you don't have that daily gratification of touching and seeing the, the involvement or the effect that you're having on people. On the other hand, I look at it as real public service because you don't have that daily gratification that right. you get from, from other kinds of you jobs. you got to be in it for the right Being reason. a governor or being a mayor has a very different sense of daily gratification because, again, you're seeing the people that you're affecting in such a, a realistic way. Um, this, is, this other is really, really important, and I think you, have to, you need really good people serving in these positions, but it's a different kind of thing, and you've got to remember what a privilege it is to wake up every day and to be weighing in on behalf mm. of people here in Tennessee regarding things that are not only important to them, important to their children, but important to people all around the world. Tell me about your family. I have a wonderful wife uh, who uh, I've been married to for 25 years. I met her on a blind date here in Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, I have two daughters that are 24 and, and 23. We had kids right away. Uh, my 24-year-old daughter is married to someone who used to work on our staff as an energy staffer in Washington. They live in Washington. She sells real estate. And my daughter uh, uh, is a head of product development for a company called Feed Projects in West Village, New York, where she uh, the, a portion of what they make goes to, to help women and children in Africa uh, have food to eat. Awesome. Let me thank you publicly. Uh, when I was first getting started here in this market, uh, you came on the show a bunch of times. I remember one time after one show, you probably won't even remember this. You were about to leave, you shook my hand and you looked at me and you said, you got something going on here, keep it up. I don't know that the people who are successful realize the impact of just affirming people who are on the grow. But thank you for doing that. Yeah, well you've done a great job and I know it's gonna continue. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time on Anything is Possible.